So I want tonight I'm doing a, a program on Yankee ingenuity, which is pretty big. And I, I wondered how many of you think of yourselves as Yankees. So, did you grow up with the phrase Yankee ingenuity? I've heard you know it. That? You've heard it. I'm familiar with it. I grew up with it. And I think a lot of people do, at least in northern New England. I don't think that Yankees are any more uh, ingenious than anybody else, but they certainly are prouder of it. You don't hear people talking about Ohio ingenuity or Florida ingenuity or something like that. But we have Yankee ingenuity. And for me, it was always a, a mixed kind of term. It was, it was a term of praise. Like the old guy, for instance, in Lovell, who long before they were manufactured, built himself a snow, a snow machine, he called it, using an old Ford motor, um, and he rode it all the way up to the top of Bald Face Mountain. And so that was Yankee ingenuity, and that was really good, the kind of making do. And my aunt, my dear aunt, she was amazing. She could serve a dozen people with a half a pound of hamburger. <laughs> That's Yankee ingenuity. She built herself a house, a little camp, a cottage by the next side of the lake. She had no money. She was a librarian. You understand that situation. And so she, she begged pieces of wood from everybody, and she went through family and relatives' attics. She got my great-grandmother's wood cook stove, which is still a very good cook stove. And she built herself a little house. And long, long after she could no longer use it, we decided to build our winter house on the footprint of her camp because it was right next to the lake and grandfathered there. And the carpenter who took it down said, there were not two pieces of wood the same size in the whole building. That's Yankee ingenuity, you know. So mostly it's kind of, I think, making do with what you've got in an ingenious way. Making do with wherever the divine puts you in life. But it had other resonances, too, I have to say. When I was a child, I loved to fish. I really loved to. When I couldn't fish, I read Field and Stream magazine, cover to cover, you know, watching these great big guys catch great big northern pike and so on. We didn't have those at our lake, but we had fish. And <coughs> so I would read it, and in the back of Field and Stream, there were usually plans for something you could build. And one year when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11, I decided to build myself something from the magazine. It was a, a one-person fishing raft. And it was made of two um, three-by-three three pieces of half-inch plywood, and then some two-by-three boards that you, you made a kind of a rim around the edges of one of the pieces of plywood, and then you attached them together so you had a big six by three rectangle. And in the front piece of wood, you cut a half a circle hole, sort of like this, facing forward. And then you got two truck inner tubes. I don't know what's happened to truck inner tubes now. They were, they were essential once, but you can't find them anymore, but we had them. So you tied two truck inner tubes, one under the front board and one under the back board. Then the idea was you took your fishing tackle and all your equipment and you put it in that little rimmed shelf behind you. And then you sat in the front with your feet dangling through that hole and you paddled and that was how you made it move. You see, I don't know what it did to the fish underneath, but you, you, you moved it along that way. So I made it and then I took my whole family down to the beach for the, for the launch of it, and I put it out in the water, and everybody was clapping, and I stepped into it, sat down, and the whole thing turned upside down, so my feet were paddling upside down like that, and I was deeply embarrassed, of course. And the next morning when I came down to the beach, my father had christened my little boat. He called it Yankee Ingenuity. <laughs> So it was this kind of a term of equivocal stuff. Now, <clears throat> you probably have people in your families, maybe you are one of them, who do really 
interesting, ingenious, practical things from time to time. Do you have some Yankee ingenuity in your family? You might think of something. You might think of something. My husband did not. I don't know. Um, you got somebody, Russ? Yeah. What? Uh, for fun, I play with ham radios. So part of the hobby includes being able to build and erect antenna systems. And I've constructed a number of them using very Yankee ingenuity techniques. That's cool. It's enjoyable. That's really good. I'm, I'm, I'm always distracted by clever, ingenious things. I was driving down the road in, in, in East Conway, New Hampshire. I was on my way home. It's right on the border, the main border. And I was driving along, and suddenly something in a yard caught my eye, and I screeched to a stop, did a U-turn, came back, and pulled into the dooryard. Because what I had seen, I have to show you this, what I had seen was this. It's, it's a bicycle with a, a, a push lawnmower welded on instead of the front wheel. And there was a gentleman sitting in an Adirondack chair in, in the yard laughing at me because I stopped so suddenly. And uh, he said, yeah, I, I get a lot of good conversations from that. You know, it's a better mousetrap right there. So we chatted for a while about how he'd made it. He was a retired welder. And so he, he, that was how he knew how to put it together. And I finally said, well, what led you to invent this? And he said, well, Really, it was my wife. She's always wanted one of those ride-on mowers. <laughs> <laughs> Yankee ingenuity strikes again. <coughs> so, I have a few stories I'd love to tell you. I'm going to start with history. Um, a story about a woman who was kind of headstrong and outrageous. A woman who was one of the first uh, English settlers in the settlement in western Maine that became Norway, Maine. I don't know if you've ever been in that area, but it's, it's about 45 miles northwest of Portland. Um, Portland was called Falmouth in those days. But anyway, her name was Elizabeth Stevens, Betty Stevens. And right after the Revolutionary War, uh, a lot of families swarmed into the inland parts of Maine and New Hampshire and settled new towns because the French had been driven out and the native peoples had temporarily moved to the north. So the Stevens family and a few other families joined together and they went up to found the settlement that became Norway. It was hard to get there. There was no road. It was just a path. Anything you needed, you had to carry or drag the 45 miles from Falmouth, you know, across streams, through the woods, over rocks, over hills. <coughs> and those people had a kind of hard time. Sometimes, you know, there wasn't anything really in good supply except for rocks and trees and water. Everything else had to be made or dragged or carried. And despite the hardness of it, Occasionally, they got something a little extra. And at one point, the men of Norway pooled their resources, and they went to Falmouth, and they purchased a large barrel of West Indian rum. And they managed to drag it on a scoot sled all the way to Norway. When they got it there, they set it up on sawhorses in the cellar of the Hobbs cabin. It developed fairly soon that most of the men of Norway, most evenings, had urgent business with the Hobbses. And they were coming home later and later and in worse and worse condition. And their wives didn't like it, but they didn't know what to do about it. Until Betty came up with an idea. And one day, when the men were all off at a barn raising, she led a delegation of wives to the Hobbs cabin. They went down in the cellar, and the other women held candles for light while Betty got down underneath the belly of that barrel with a wimble. You ever heard of a wimble? It's, it's, a, it's an old-fashioned English name for a hand drill, an auger. So she gets down there under the barrel, and she drills a hole, 
into the barrel, and all that rum poured out and soaked into the dirt floor of the cellar. Well, that evening, when the men discovered what had happened to their hard-won rum, there was such an explosion of rage in Norway that the women were terrified and they turned state's evidence and said it had been Betty's idea, which it had, and she had to take refuge and barricade herself into the loft of her cabin for a day and a half because she was afraid for her life. But eventually the, the rage died down, but not the memory. This was Maine. And she was called the rest of her life Wimble Betty. So Wimble Betty, the story I want to tell you about Wimble Betty happened a couple of years later when they finally finished a road from Falmouth to some of the backcountry settlements, including Norway, a road that a wagon could navigate with some difficulty, but it still could. And as soon as that road was finished, a peddler in Falmouth with the rather ominous name of Wiley Swift decided he was going to go on a merchandising trip. And he loaded up his wagon, but just before he left Falmouth, a brig docked from Cuba with a load of molasses and something that even on the coast of Maine was very unusual in those days, coconuts. And Wiley looked at those and he said, ha ha, you know, those are going to be quite a novelty in the back country. I bet you I could get a shilling apiece for them, which was a lot of money. So he loaded up a couple dozen coconuts in his wagon too, and he set off. And he had a really he went from settlement to settlement, and people needed the things that he sold that they couldn't make. Tinware, needles, silk thread, all kinds of things of that nature. <coughs> so he did a thriving business, but one day he realized he had one settlement left, and that was Norway, and he still had his whole load of coconuts. No one had wanted them. Either they were just too weird or... Well, you know, in those days, people didn't have cash money, particularly. Everything they bought, they bartered for things they'd made or grown or trapped. And they weren't going to waste that labor on something like a coconut. So he was getting desperate. Well, he arrived in Norway on another day when the men were out of town. They were, they were at a militia muster. So he pulled into the, hop, the Eastman cabin. <clears throat> and he pulled into the dooryard, and he reached down in his wagon, and he pulled up a coconut. And when Aunt Nabby Eastman came out, he said, Madam, see what I have brought for you. What's that? As soon as he saw, she didn't know what it was. His imagination was wild. Madam, this is the egg of a gorgeously beautiful bird known as the golly whopper. Why, you know, it's not so tall as your ostrich, but it's bigger than your turkey. Um, I would say that no animal is more useful than a new farm where chickens and ducks and lambs are being raised. Why, um, its peculiar cries will frighten off anything. Um, you can take this egg and you can hatch it in under your goose, or if your goose refuses to set, wrap it in a little flannel, put it in the corner of your hearth, and it'll hatch in precisely 22 days. <laughs> well, Aunt Nabby was a practical woman. She said, what do I want with a golly waker? Madam, it's a golly whopper. Uh, as I said, its peculiar cries will frighten off owls, hawks, Wolves, foxes, bears. I have seen a golly whopper chase a fox for a mile and a half without stopping. It is a true fact, madam, that no farm protected by golly whoppers has ever been troubled by those destructive pests. Furthermore, uh, southern women fancy them. They're beautiful red and green feathers. They use them to trim their hats. Well, as he spun this out, he could see her eyes getting bigger and bigger, and he knew he had her. She bought two so she could raise a flock. 
and she gave him three otter pelts that her husband had trapped. He was off and running. He went from farmstead to scattered farmstead, and as soon as one housewife heard that her neighbor was about to raise a profitable flock of gollywhoppers, she had to have some too. He got retted flax, he got sheepskins, he got more pelts. In fact, he did such a good business that by dinner time, noon, he had sold all but one of his eggs, and he had only one more farm to visit, and that was Wimble Betty's. Well, he pulled into her dooryard, and when she came out, he lifted his last coconut and said, Madam, I have saved my last golly whopper's egg for you. Well, Wimble Betty was not like the other women of the settlement. She had spent her youth in Old Salem, which was at that time a port rivaling Boston. And she'd seen a lot of ships die and a lot of cargoes unloaded. And she knew a coconut when she saw one. But she knew how to hold her tongue. So she said, what did you say about what? And he launched into his now well-practiced pattern. And she got him to tell her what her neighbors had paid for their eggs. She said later on, she had thought of the way they'd turned against her in the matter of the West Indian rum and had almost let them hatch their eggs, but he was too outrageous. So finally she said, well, how much do you want for it? Oh, madam since it's my last one and since it's you, I could let you have it for two shillings and sixpence, which I think is about $30 in current money. Ah, oh, I don't have that kind of cash money. Well, I have an idea. Why don't you give your, give your horse and your, your, your wagon to me, we'll put them in the barn, give your horse a feed, and you can come into my house and I'll give you your dinner and you can eat your dinner and have a smoke while I go and see if I can borrow that money from my neighbors. It sounded good to him. So she got the horse and wagon in the barn. She gave him his dinner, and she set off. She got to Navi Eastman. She didn't waste too much time giving her a lecture on tropical botany. And then they went from house to house to house until marching behind her down that new road. Wimble Betty had seven sturdy pioneer women carrying coconuts and pitchforks. You seen those colonial pitchforks that were two long, sharp tines? Picture that. She was a good general. She led them around behind her cabin where there were no windows and they secured the barn. Meanwhile, in her house, Wiley Swift was sitting, he'd had a good dinner, he had his feet up on the hearth, he was having a smoke, he was thinking about what an unexpectedly profitable a day it had been. He had no inkling that his fortunes were about to change until a coconut came bouncing in the door, followed by Wimble Betty, you thief! You're gonna pay back all my neighbors, everything you took from them by fraud, I am not! And he shoved her aside, elbowed his way out the door, ran for the barn, only to be confronted by 14 sharpened pitchfork tines, wielded by sturdy pioneer women who knew how to pitch hay. He had a choice, surrender or perforation. Well, ladies, I surrender. I surrender. I'll give you back your goods. Just give me my wagon. And Wimble Betty said, no, sir. A man who will tell one lie will tell two. I'll get the goods. And she went into the barn and she shoved the wagon out and the women pitched in their coconuts and took out what they'd paid. And then she turned to him and then she said, now you golly whopper, one more thing. You owe me for a dinner and a feed for your horse. And once you've given me six packs of pins, two packs of needles, and five hanks of silk thread, we'll call it square. He paid up, she gave him his horse, and Wiley Swift drove off a wiser man. According to um, her great nephew, um, C.A. Stevens of Norway, 
in whose memoir I found this story, Wimble Betty lived to be 94, and in all that time, her character did not change. That's Wimble Betty. <coughs> I love stories where one ingenuity butts up against another, and it comes out all right. But I also love stories of unusual ingenuities. And uh, I'm going to tell you one about that I ran into. It's rather more modern. Quite a year, few years ago, I was hired by a group in Oxford County, Maine, who wanted to put together a, a pamphlet that was a kind of guide for tourists to what was happening in Oxford County. And they wanted me to go around as a folklorist and make a, a catalog of all the traditional events that happened every year in different towns that tourists could visit. So I went around and I collected a lot of bean suppers and Uno games and those kinds of things, hunters' breakfasts. And then I got to the town of Otisville. And I discovered something called the Joe Holden picnic that happened every August. And I thought I'd find that out. I didn't know who Joe Holden was. So one day I wound up in Otisfield, actually in East Otisfield, on an otherwise empty, beautiful, bald hillside where across from the East Otisfield Free Baptist, Baptist Church in the Elmwood Cemetery, I found the Holden tombstone. It was a handsome, tall, white marble tombstone. The front of it in good New England style, just plain Holden in block capitals. But around on the side, I found Joe Holden's inscription. It said, Professor Joseph W. Holden. Born in Otisfield, August 24th, 1816. Died March 1st, 1900. Professor Holden, the old astronomer, discovered that the Earth is flat and stationary and the sun and moon do move. Well, I wonder about that. I mean, it couldn't be just a joke. This was an expensive marble tombstone. And I wondered about a man who could just sort of set aside Copernicus and Galileo and 300 years of scientific exploration. And I also wondered about the town that would celebrate him for so long with a picnic for doing that. <coughs> so I started to look into Otisfield. And I discovered that Otisfield is a surprisingly strong-willed and unusual place. Forty-odd years ago, the citizens of Otisfield outraged that their tax dollars were going to be used to build a community and civic center that they had no use for, voted to secede from, Oxford, from Cumberland County. And they did that. And Otisfield is now in Oxford County. And if you look at the southern border of Oxford County, it goes like this, then it kind of pooches out for Otisfield and keeps going. And I discovered, too, that the family of Joe Holden is also unusual and determined. His mother, uh, <coughs> his mother Abigail, was convinced that uh, the Lord had called her to preach the gospel which was very unusual for women in the early 19th century, but she told her husband about it, and he accepted that. And he said, well, Nabby, um, has the Lord told you where he intends you to have your ministry? The Lord had not. He said, well, why don't you hitch up the horse, give him his head, and see if he takes you to the place that the Lord intends you to preach? So she went to the barn and she hitched the, the, the buggy to the horse. She urged him out the back door of the barn and gave him his head. And very carefully, the, the horse walked around the house and back in the front door of the barn. I don't know if she preached in that barn, although it did say 
that she spoke up in church rather more often than people thought a woman should. And she kept on working on her faith. And after a while, she came to believe that her faith was so strong that like Peter in the gospel, she should be able to walk on water. So she told her husband, and he accepted that. He put her in the buggy, and they drove down to the shore of Saturday Pond. And she got out, and she started to walk, and she walked to the water, and then she kept on walking, and the, the pond water rose up to her knees and raised up her voluminous Victorian skirts, and then they settled down. And when the water got to her waist, she decided she still needed to do some more work on her faith. So she turned around and went back and got in the buggy, and they drove back home. He accepted that. Well, her son Joseph had some of her determination. But if you look at his biography, it looks like a very ordinary 19th century biography. He was a businessman. He owned three different sawmills in Otisfield. He was a staunch anti-slavery man. He <clears throat> studied the law, although he didn't practice law. He used it in his business, and he also used it in the business of the town because the citizens of Otisfield several times elected him to the Board of Selectmen, reasoning, I think, that his belief that the earth was flat was not going to affect his judgment in civic matters, but he had that belief, and he thought that he had proved it with a scientific experiment. As near as I can find out, this was the experiment. He took a measured quantity of water and poured it into a basin. And then he took the basin outside and set it on a stump overnight. And in the morning, he came out and he measured the water, and it was the same. And he said, now look here. If the earth moved a little bit, some of that would have sloshed out. And if the earth turned over, why? That basin and the house, the whole state of Maine be in the roof. Evidently, he had not heard of Sir Isaac Newton either. But that was his proof. And like his mother, he wanted to preach. So from time to time, he did that. He got two great big pieces of canvas. And on one of them, he painted the solar system the way other people thought it was. And on the other, he painted it the way he knew it and then he rolled them up and he went on lecture tours. He lectured in Portland, he lectured in Bangor, he le lectured all up the state of Maine to Aroostook County. He lectured in Boston. In 1893, he went to the, the um, World's Fair in Chicago and he lectured there. He charged up to 25 cents for his lectures, which was significant. And he always ended them the same way. He'd look out over the audience and he'd say, now, which one of you believe that the earth is flat and stationary and the sun and moon do move? And hands would go up and he'd look out and he'd say, unanimous, and then he'd walk out of the lecture hall. In his later years, he took to haunting the legislature halls in Augusta. And so as soon as a legislator would walk by, he'd go out and he'd buttonhole him and he'd tell him his theories. So he was quite an unusual lobbyist. He had those theories, and he would not be put down. Once he, 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 he talked to a reporter from the Lewiston Journal, who said, you know, that fellow, he said to me, you know, you're as bad as one of them professors from Bates's College. There ain't no arguing against them ideas of yours. You know, I hadn't even given him half of what I had up my sleeve. But he was tested. At one point, a group of the rowdy youth of Otisfield came to him with the deal. They said, we want to test your theory. And they went and they got a, a long stake, a wooden stake, and they drove it in the Garrett ground halfway between Holden's office and the mill, the mill pond. And they took an old white ceramic chamber turned it over and balanced it on top of that stake. They said, now, Professor Holden, um, if that chamber pot is still on the stake tomorrow morning, you're right. 
But if it's off that stake, will you agree that you were wrong in your theory? And Holden agreed, provided that if the chamber pot stayed put, they would agree that they were wrong. Well, turns out that running a sawmill is, is a hard business. Holden had to work late in his office. Somebody coming by after dark could have seen through the window of his office, could have seen him sitting at his desk and that lantern on his desk shining out and gleaming off that white chamber pot and gleaming off the steel barrel of the shotgun there on his desk. He had to work all night. And in the morning, the chamber pot was still there. And the youth had to agree that they had been mistaken. Well, Joe Holden was a member, like his parents, of the East Otisfield Free Baptist Church. And in his will, he left a $300 endowment for the purchase and inscription of that white marble tombstone. And he left an endowment to provide $3 a year for the provision of food for the annual church picnic. Some years later, another stubborn son of Otisfield augmented that uh, endowment to provide strawberry ice cream, peanuts, and popcorn for the annual picnic. When I talked to the current pastor of the church, she said, she didn't like strawberry ice cream. And she had endeavored to break the will to allow the introduction of chocolate. But she had failed. Otisfield is a stubborn place. So every year until very recently, more than a century, people from Otisfield and towns all around gather on the last Sunday in August for the Joe Holden picnic. And they eat strawberry ice cream, peanuts, and popcorn. And as the late Nellie Hankins said, we raise our cups to old Joe, not for his scientific acumen, but for his positive and contrary spirit. <laughs> Joe Holden. I like that. Yeah, me too. It's another kind of Yankee ingenuity. <coughs> You have it in you for one more short bunch of stories, more recent? Well, I'll tell you one because this is another guy that I really admire. He's much more modern. I told you that when I was a child, I loved to fish. And I was particularly proud when I was old enough to have my own junior fishing license. So I went down to the town clerk's office and I gave them my dollar or whatever it was, and she gave me a shiny new fishing license, and I took it home and I put it in my tackle box. And I said to my father, you know, this evening we're going to go fishing. So right before dinner, we got in our canoe and we paddled out toward the island in the middle of the lake, and we were fishing there. And then we heard this, and we saw a little aluminum boat coming across the lake, one man in it probably a 10 horse motor. And as he got closer to us, he reached down in the bed of the boat and put on his hat. And my father said, aha, uh -huh, that's the game board. And he pulled up to the canoe and politely turned off his, his engine and greeted us and asked my father if he had his fishing license. And my father produced it. And the game warden looked at it, handed it back and said, I hope you have a very good evening. And he was just about to start his motor again. I said, don't you want to see my fishing license? And he turned around and said, yes, young lady, do you have it with you? And I did. And I showed it to him and he gave it appropriate contemplation. And then he said, your documents are in order. And then he started his motor to start drawing. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that was my first and only meeting with Lovell's legendary game warden, Irvin Lord. He was the game warden in the Lovell area for 20 odd years after World War II. And much later than that episode, I started to hear interesting things about him. 
people would say, Reverend Moore, oh yeah, he was a nice guy. He arrested me once. And his daughter, Pam, said, Dad treated the public the same way he treated us in the family. Give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves. And his son, Bill, said, Dad had a sense of fear. Wouldn't that make you fearless, that whole lineup of stuff? So I started to think about his situation. And what would it be to be the only law enforcement officer in a very small town? I think Lovell had about 70, 750 people. And your children go to school with everyone else's children. Your neighbors all know you. You know all your neighbors, some of them better than they might wish. It's a job that requires a good deal of you know, personal and social and legal subtlety, ingenuity even. So I started to tune my ear for stories about Irvin Lord. He was a very modest man. That little tin rowboat that he had a little putt-butt motor on, that was his only water and it had no official markings on it. He, people said he had a, a hand-cranked siren, but he never used it. His major, major implement of his job, I think, was a pair of binoculars, and he used them very well. Um, <coughs> one time, he was out on the lake early in the morning, and he's looking around, and across the lake, he sees a woman standing next to her dock in waders, fishing. And he's watching her, and she's having a phenomenally good day. She's just reeling him in, you know, reeling him in, reeling him in, tossing him in the basket next to her. And he watches for a little while, and she's way over the limit. So he starts up his little putt-putt, and she hears it way across the lake, and she moves over to stand between him and the basket and stuffs most of the fish down inside her wader. So that by the time Lord comes up, she's standing there innocently with her fishing rod, a couple of fish in the basket. Good morning, how are you doing? Isn't it a beautiful day? Oh, yes, Irvin, it's a beautiful day. How's the fishing? Oh, it's kind of slow, but it's such a beautiful day. You know, I just had to be out here. It is lovely, isn't it? It's been an unusual week, hasn't it? You know, yesterday, well, we had that early morning storm and then it cleared up some and well the day before it was kind of chilly wasn't it for the season and you know I kind of worried about a drought before we had that storm. You talk for, about the weather for, for quite a while. I think not all those fish in the waders were dead and she was clearly kind of uncomfortable and finally she said Irvin wouldn't you like to come up to the house for some lemonade? Oh I couldn't do that. I, I, I'm on duty. He knew that if she got out there, she'd dump the fish and then all the others could be gone. So he said, well, tell me how, you, how your children are doing. How's the family? You know, where are they these days? Tell me all about them. And finally, she just wore down. She said, oh, Irvin, you got me. She climbed out and she dumped the fish out of the waders and they counted them and he wrote her a ticket and he saluted her and went off. I think that's given him enough rope, don't you? That's really given him enough rope. <clears throat> of course, the busiest time, he had a very good, he, had, he knew the difference between right and wrong, I have to say, but he also knew what those things meant in the community. So, in hunting season, for instance, busiest time of his year, of course, as a game warden, he had a lot of challenges. In those days, you didn't take your deer to the local store or wherever to get it registered, to get it tagged. You took it right to the game warden's house. So one morning on the very last day of hunting season, Irvin was at home, pickup truck pulls into his yard, and um, there's a handsome buck in the bed of the truck. A man and his wife, Irvin recognizes, and he comes out and he says, that's, that's a very nice buck. But he knows that that man and both of his sons have already gotten their deer for the year, and yet here's another one. So he says, um, who shot it? The man says, oh, mother here, mother shot it. Well, that was a great shot. When did you shoot it? Oh, just about an hour ago, Irving. 
And, and where did you happen to shoot it? Oh, just on that ridge up above your house, right up there, yeah? And so he starts to fill out the form on his clipboard, and he looks over, and he sees that Mother is still wearing her bunny slippers, and that her nightie is peeking out from under, <laughs> under her coat, and he realizes she has not been hunting that morning. But he also knows how much that meat was going to matter to that family that had didn't have two dimes to rub together. So he says, well, that was a very good shot, and I congratulate you. And he tagged the deer to her, and they took it home. But he was no pushover. He hated people who broke the law and were hunting. Particularly, he hated night hunters, you know, jacking deer, hunting deer with a, a spotlight so that they, if the deer in the headlights, they freeze and they're easy to shoot. It's deeply illegal. And he hated that. <clears throat> One night he was at home and he got a phone call from a farmer in the next town and said, Irvin, uh, I think there's a bunch of yahoos in my back field, uh, jack and deer. So Irvin said, I'll be there. And he put on his uniform, his hat, his gun, and his gun belt. And he invited his young son, Bill, to come along. And they got in his vehicle, and they drove toward the field. When they got close to it, he turned off the headlights, and he just cruised in and parked his vehicle across the exit to the field. And they could see, you know, up there on the hillside, they could see the truck. They could see the, the spotlight that they were using and all. And they just waited. And when the men drove to get out of the field and realized that their way was blocked, Irvin took off his gun belt, and he put it and his gun in the back seat, and he said to Bill, don't touch that gun, and don't get out of the car. And he got out, and he walked up to the driver's side window of that truck, and he said, gentlemen, give me your weapons. And immediately, the barrel of the rifle was under his face, just like that. <laughs> and he set it down. And now the another one, and another. And when they had all their weapons, he took their names and he officially arrested them. And then they went home. And he said to Bill, you know, easiest way to get shot is to carry a gun. People have trouble shooting an unarmed man. And Bill was just happy that that was true that night. But that was a very different, darker sense of thriller, I think, that night. Other night work that Irving did, I think he enjoyed much more. Uh, particularly in the early spring, have you ever gone smelting, any of you? The smelts are they're little fish, about yay long, and they're prime prey for big fish that people like to catch, but they're also delicious. Have you had smelts? They're really good. And <coughs> The time to catch them is when they're, when they're spawning, and they go from a deep lake up the feeder streams of the lake. And you go for them, they, they, they do their smelt runs between midnight and 2 a.m. So smelting is a particular kind of party. You take a bucket, and you take a net, and you take a certain number of beverages that seem obligatory on that sort of occasion, and you take the materials for a bonfire, and you go and make a fire, and you sit by the fire, and every now and again you go dip some smelts into your bucket to take home for, for a treat. And that's fun, except there's one brook in our lake, and there's usually a brook in other lakes, that's designated as a feeder, as a breeder stream, and it's illegal to take smelt in. And Boulder Brook was like that in our lake. And Boulder Brook was, of course, the place where there were the most smelts. So people wanted to go smelting there, but it was illegal. So Irvin had the routine. He could hide himself and his vehicle easily. He'd go down and hide his vehicle near the Boulder Brook area. And people would come down and they'd say, Irvin, where are you? We know you're here. Where are you? And they couldn't find him, so they'd go down and get their smelts and be on their way back up, and he'd turn his flashlight on them and arrest them write their tickets. One night he was doing that and a fellow dropped his bucket and started to run and Irvin ran after him and they ran around every tree in Boulder Brook and every cabin in Boulder Brook and finally Irvin said, you know, I know who you are. Why don't you just stop? You must be tired. Let's go home. So the man laughed and stopped and Irvin wrote him a ticket. 
But another night, he was there waiting, and a man was coming up, carrying a bucket. And Irvin stepped out and shone his light on him and says, you know it's not legal to take fish here. And I said, well, I'm not taking fish. Th these are my pet fish. Irvin said, so what? Well, yeah, you see, I have them at home, and then during the smelt runs, I bring them down here to the brook. And very carefully, I let them go, and they swim around, and they chat with their friends, and have a little exercise, and enjoy the water. And then I put my bucket down, and I whistle for them, and they come back into the bucket. And then we go home, and that's what we're doing. Well, Irvin said, I, I, I'd like to see them. So the man and Irvin and the bucket went down to Boulder Brook, and as the man said, he got down, he very gently let those smelt go in the brook. And then he stood up and he shook out the bucket and he started to walk back up to his truck. And Irvin said, well, aren't you going to whistle? Why would I whistle? Well, for the fish. What fish? The evidence was gone. He hadn't taken any fish. So you give people enough rope sometimes and they'll slip the, the noose, I think. He didn't mind telling the story on Irvin retired in 1969. He said being a warden wasn't what he'd signed up for. He signed up because he loved wildlife and he wanted to help people enjoy and preserve wildlife. But it had gotten too much like being a traffic, traffic cop, you know, with the ATVs and the snowmobiles. It wasn't what he wanted. So he retired. But he has not been forgotten to this day. People still think of him. Irvin Moore, he was a nice guy. He was rest of my life. So we still remember him. And that's the end. Thank you for coming. Very good. Thank you. Very good.